and action live from new york it's show and tell this week he got it right first time out what a guy hello i'm billy and this is a vintage knitting weekly podcast Today, my guest is Emily. She is a vintage knitter par excellence, and she has quite a story to tell. Before I bring on my guest, I just wanted to bring you up to date on a little bit of my knitting goings on. I am in week five of a knit along with a small group of knitters who are doing the slit neckline sweater that I have shown you. I haven't made any progress on mine. I'm waiting for the rest of the bunch to catch up to me because I wanna be able to show them how I'm assembling the sleeves and the interesting neckline. But in weeks to come, I'll be back to show you that. I also put a halt on my red The Billy Bag project because my new yarn came in for my next sweater. And of course, I couldn't resist opening the package, swatching, and jumping right in with both feet. So that's a little bit of a teaser for what will be coming up in my next episode, because on this episode, it's all about Emily. I'll be right back with her. Okay, I am back and I am here today with Emily, who is dialing in from, is it the 15th state or the 49th state? I think it's 49th. Mm -hmm. Okay, of <laughs> Alaska, the one that you can see Russia from your back porch if you're, what was her name? <laughs> Sarah Palin. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah Palin. How close are you to the Russian border? I am in the middle of Alaska near the Fairbanks area. So I'm not that close. <laughs> Can't see them from my backyard. <laughs> so my standard question for all of my guests before we get into your knitting and your vintage fashion is if we're a tourist in Fairbanks, what should we see that we're not going to find in any tourism books? Um, I would say to go to, you will find the Museum of the North in a lot of tourist books, but in the gift shop, they sell a lot of Kiviet yarn. And so Kiviet is musk ox yarn. And so that's a big thing in this area. They have a lot of musk oxen farms and they make beautiful yarn. So it's kind of a splurge, like high-end fiber but it's really, really soft and super warm. And so I had not heard of that until I moved to Alaska. And then when I was feeling it in the gift shop, I was like, oh, I want this. <laughs> so um, It's just one of those things. They make beautiful like lace work out of it and hats and stuff like that. I am actually familiar with it because I have been to Alaska nice. <laughs> on a cruise, but also the last woman who I interviewed who knits for Hollywood film and television, She's in Alaska right now, mm. I think on a cruise ship. And we got to talking about Kitty and I said, if you haven't been there, make sure you get yourself to a yarn shop. I didn't know about yeah. this museum because I wasn't in Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. I, I felt it because I wanted <laughs> to see why is this teeny little ball $200? So expensive. <laughs> yes. You're like I'm a sweater knitter. So it was just unaffordable for me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't interested in knitting a hat, maybe gloves. I don't know if I ever go back to Alaska. Uh -huh. Well, anyway, okay, so that's a good tip. <laughs> All right, now let's yeah. talk about your knitting story. Um, okay. I have been watching you for probably the last couple of years. I don't want to say stalking, but <laughs> I started to see these little short videos that you prepared, and I had no idea about your background. I just thought, well, this woman is so darling. She's so photogenic. <laughs> and she has these 
antique cars and these beautiful vintage outfits and she has some sweaters and she's got it all going on <laughs> i want to interview her but it took this long for us to finally connect i mm -hmm. think you're probably a very busy person so yeah <laughs> my first question is about your love of vintage can you identify when this began for you yes um I always grew up watching old movies and musicals like with my grandmother, but where I lived and grew up mostly in Missouri, nobody really wore vintage fashion or anything. So it just never occurred to me. Um, and then my family lived overseas for a little bit. And when I came back to college um, in the US and Missouri, I just kind of went through a small identity crisis <laughs> of like reacclimating to the culture and just trying to figure out you know, typical college, like who am I as an adult now away from my family? Um, and I saw another vintage blogger like back in 2011 that was wearing vintage clothing. And I was like, why has that never occurred to me? I love these outfits in movies. Of course I could wear them now. Like, why would I, why have I never thought about doing this? And so um, I tried wearing vintage for one summer. So that's where the name flashback summer from my accounts comes from. Um, it was an original experiment for one summer just to see if I like was just dabbling in it and if I liked it and I ended up liking it a lot. And so that's where I was like, you know what, I think I'm gonna use this to express myself. And um, it kind of helped me get through my early college identity crisis and making clothes that felt like me and that fit well and that kind of thing. So that's where flashback summer comes from. Um, so around 2011. So when you're not pregnant, are you <laughs> are you the typical vintage size that you can walk into like consignment stores, thrift shops, and buy original vintage clothing? I'm only five feet tall, so I am Me like too. a very small petite person. <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, petite, but this will be my second child and my measurements have definitely changed after pregnancy. So, um, but, but that before, being said, before, did you have a 28 inch waist? Could you go and buy authentic clothing? Yes, I could. And usually I could fit in the waist. Um, but I have very narrow shoulders too, and was petite on top. So a lot of times the top wouldn't fit. So <laughs> I'd be like good from the waist down, but the waist up would still be a little bit of a struggle. I've heard people yeah. say that because vintage clothing is made so well, that it's worth buying things, even if they don't fit perfectly and taking them to a mm -hmm. dressmaker to have them altered. Like, you know, it's just a matter of adjusting the shoulders. I yeah. know that's not easy, but if it costs money to do that, you would still end mm -hmm. up with something that would be so much more valuable than what you paid, including the alterations. Oh, yeah. Because the, mm -hmm. the workmanship, you know, the pleats, the way buttons are done, the yes. way colors are done. be really lovely. So, like, couture, even though it wasn't couture, there was just so much yeah. more attention to detail. Yep. So anyway, so this has been how many years? 10? Yeah, 10 or so years now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. <laughs> and the knitting, have you always been a knitter or this came along with the vintage interest? Um, I attempted knitting like as a kid. Um, back when fun fur scarves were a thing, I don't, <laughs> there was like a phase with furry scarves that was popular, but I was a kid and it was very poorly done. Um, so I picked it back up later as part of like liking vintage fashion. I saw a lot of um, like 1930s and 40s knits, especially that I really, really liked. And I really liked that they stretch and that they work with more measurements than just like fabric that doesn't stretch. Um, but they tend to be very expensive. And so I was finally like, you know, what? I think I'm going to learn to make that for myself <laughs> because they're difficult to find originals and they tend to be very expensive. So that was kind of what spurred on my desire. I learned how to knit first. And then a lot of times you need some crochet skills to finish off knitting projects. So I started dabbling in that. 
Um, and now I'm to the point where I can crochet small things like hats. I haven't gotten up to full bravery to crochet like a sweater or something quite yet, but um, I've just kind of developed it over the years, lots of trial and error and school of YouTube. <laughs> So <laughs> this for you too, right? Um, I thought that I remembered something from way back about you recycling old sweaters. Have you taken old sweaters apart or done something unusual with them? Um, I will. I've definitely taken some of my like early projects that just weren't good and frogged those. Um, as well, I will find vintage sweaters and. I have like developed the skills to mend them. So like a lot of the 1940s and 50s ski sweaters are another item that they're super cute and popular, but they tend to be like two to $300 a piece if you buy an original one. But if you buy one that has a lot of moth holes in it, <laughs> then they could be like more around 60 to 100. And so I kind of took more of those knitting skills and learned how to knit with like darning and repair of knits, which has helped me with my own projects as well. As I've been knitting long enough, they're starting to need repair. So um, kind of like uh, accompanying skill sets, you know, so as I keep falling down the rabbit hole of fiber arts, <laughs> I keep adding like little skills here and there as I need them. Now on your blog, do you talk about that? I glanced at your, at your blog. Do you talk about doing um, make do amend? The mend um, I think I think I do a little bit. Um, and on my Instagram account, I think I have a mending highlight where I'll kind of show some of my before and afters. Um, but that being said, I'm not like super super skilled in mending. I like to try invisible mending is more my deal to try to make it look like there's no repair at all. Um, so I'm still working on it, but I do have a highlight where I tag other accounts that I've learned things from that are really good at it. So tell us your Instagram account and your blog. Flashback Summer .com. is my Instagram handle and dot com, both of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And I'll put that on the screen and in the show notes. Sweet. Um, I read that you consider yourself a third culture kid, but can you tell the people what that is? Yes, um, I briefly mentioned it before, but my family lived overseas when I was in high school. Uh, my parents did community development work. So we lived in Egypt and Sudan in East Africa. So what a third culture kid is, it's kind of a term that accompanies kids that have lived in cultures different than their parents' culture or their passport culture while they're growing up. So it's kind of the idea that um, you have your parents' culture, your passport culture, and the culture that you live in, and you're kind of a combination of both. So you're a third culture kid. And so that's kind of what I think reflects me. I've kind of got a little bit of how East Africa really changed my worldview. I grew up in Missouri as well. So I've kind of got this combination of worldview and cultural traits that I've picked up throughout the years that describe me. And so that's what a third culture kid is. <laughs> How long did you live in East Africa? I just lived there a couple of years, like my later part of high school. Um, but my family still lives overseas in the Middle East. So mm -hmm. Um, I'll go back and visit them and it's still a part of our lives. Mm -hmm. How does the military play into this? Were your parents in the military? No, they weren't. Um, since the World War II type generation, I'm the first one that's been in my family, like in the military. So my husband and I are both in the Air Force. And so, yep. <laughs> but we do travel a lot. I haven't actually been overseas with the military yet, which is funny. So oh, I traveled wow. more as a civilian, but we're getting there. So I've only been in a few years. So. so I want to share a couple of pictures with you, actually. So let's so this is the lovely woman who my father married after he was married to my mother. Mm. Um, she served in the 
Persian Gulf Service Command during World War II. She was an army nurse. I don't know what? if you're familiar with this insignia because one of yes. my other guests, she's a collector of World War II American mm. um, military uniforms, even mm -hmm. though she's non-American. And she knew <laughs> right away, she knew like this was army and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But here we oh, are. This is your pinup girl, 1940s yeah. military. She's beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a really beautiful photograph. And then just for the fun of it, I have one more. This is my paternal grandfather. He was an immigrant to the United States, but mm -hmm. shortly after he arrived here, maybe six or seven years after he arrived at Ellis Island, World War I had broken out and he mm -hmm. served in France for the United mm -hmm. States also army. Now this flag is before Alaska. There's only 48 mm -hmm. stars on that flag. I think yeah. 48. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. How so cool to I'm, have that family history. Yeah, I'm really happy to have those pictures in my possession. Okay, so let's see some sweaters. <laughs> okay, so I have a long, this is a great segue. So along with patriotic military things, um, one of my favorite projects is this one. So I'll just show the motif there. So a sweater, this is from a 1940s original pattern. Um, and I like obviously being in the military. Um, I like making patriotic <laughs> Americana type things. And so I love a lot of 1940s patterns because World War II, they were very into, you know, patriotism and showing it in what you wear. So a lot of the patterns from the 40s have fun motifs like this. It's got stars on the back. Um, so it's just a super fun one, just a pretty plain sweater other than all the designs up at the top. So I love that one. It's How one did you find such a pattern? Um, I go on Etsy a lot. There's a lot of people that will do digital reproductions of old patterns. Um, this one is from a store called Wearing History. So she reproduces a lot of both knitting and sewing patterns. Um, and so I got that from her shop and I have knitted this one up, I think twice in just different colors because I really like it. And I also plan on using the same pattern but maybe changing the design up here a little bit to customize it so it's a really good basic pattern for that that's one of my favorite ones and then i kind of did a variety of things that i've made recently or just that are my favorite so this one i wanted to share because i haven't okay it looks really tiny but that's just because the body is ribbed mm -hmm. and it's very very stretchy so imagine with me that this is the size of an actual person um <laughs> but it's got really big mohair sleeves very poofy um this one is a pattern that is a modern pattern from fable knitwear and so she makes like really romantic designs that they go well with vintage style because they kind of harken back to like an early 1900s, you know, very voluminous sleeves, very romantic styling. Um, so I was a test knitter for one of the patterns that just came out and I had never knitted with mohair before. And so that was a fun adventure in realizing you kind of get one shot. It's hard to frog mohair. And so... <laughs> I was just working hard not to make mistakes on this one. I heard the trick is to put it in the freezer. Oh, really? That the mohair settles down and then you can frog. I've never that tried it, but that's it. supposed to be a trick. Hmm, I'm gonna log that away because I definitely struggled a couple times. That's good to know. Those uh, sleeves look like they could be almost an entire sweater just one sleeve looks like they're enormous. Yeah. The, the number of stitches huge. in a whole sweater. <laughs> they're huge. Yeah, it's, they're huge. It took a lot of knitting, but I think it's worth it. And I can't wear it yet. I haven't worn it because I finished it when I was newly pregnant and didn't fit into it anymore. 
Um, but I'm excited to wear it after because the sleeves are enormous. And are there shoulder pads in there? Oh, there are. Not shoulder pads. I've got like little tool puffy things in oh. here, like a little tool puff. Um, that's what the pattern recommended. I tried it with and without to see which one I liked better. And I like it with. I'm going full puff on these sleeves. So <laughs> might as well get the I've full volume. I've seen people do ribbon that's folded like an accordion and oh, I've seen amazing. knitted shoulder pads, but I've never seen tools. Yeah, I saw that's like what she recommended. So I folded it in half a couple times and just like sewed a little little puff on there. And it works quite well, especially for how drapey this is. It doesn't make like a shoulder pad line. You know what I mean? It's a little yes. soft. So that worked out well cute um and I like I brought this as well I really like taking the scraps of projects and then making coordinating accessories to go with them so I used the scraps from this and made a beret to go with it and oftentimes this turns into a pretty intense game of yarn chicken because I have no idea if I actually have enough to, <laughs> to finish my projects um this one did work out, but you'll see I have a little skin toned line. I was literally three rows away from being able to finish when I ran out of yarn. So we should um, figure out like how many <laughs> ounces of yarn, a fingering weight yarn, for example, it takes to make a beret. Yes. And then everybody will just know that if you have that, you're good to go. Yeah. And I, I tried to estimate and it never works out. <laughs> so um, it's always just luck of the draw. Um, but this is from a 1930s pattern because berets were really popular then. And this is one of my first all crochet projects. So it actually worked out. Oh, it's crochet. a little. Well, if you were playing yarn chicken, why did you crochet? It takes so much more yarn than knitting. <laughs> because I didn't realize it would take so much more yarn because I don't crochet as much. Oh. So this was a good learning lesson for me. I was like, wow, that, okay. that took a lot longer, but it looks lovely now. <laughs> It's great looking. I mean, I've knit some berets. I've knit a couple different patterns, but mm -hmm. I haven't crocheted one. It looks mm -hmm. good. Same here. So it took me again a couple tries, and you know, you shouldn't look too closely at it, but for wearing it, <laughs> it presents nicely. So got that one. And then I'm just going to share my other. This is my first Fair Isle project that I did. So I'm um, just gonna do a little close up here on the pattern. This is from a Susan Crawford Shetland knitting book. So I just love that book so much. Um, the Vintage Shetland Project. And so I, these are her yarns as well. And this was the first time that I had done steaks. And the first time I had done like this type of pattern as well. I like to choose projects that are just slightly out of my skill level. <laughs> um, so then I can learn new stuff as I go. And so this is one of those, but I will say that doing steaks for the first time and actually cutting something that you just knitted was terrifying. So <laughs> I, did, I did her genie also from that book, mm -hmm. the Vintage Shetland Project, but the genie had super high stitch count it was mm. 42 stitches to four inches oh it's definitely and fewer. when I started to steep I really panicked because it was <laughs> really to unravel I mean I secured it mm -hmm. but not enough so I had fray check <laughs> and I just went up and down <laughs> with that stuff to like lock it in place but it's, it's beautiful I'm really happy like you, yeah. I try from time to time to like, <laughs> you know, push the envelope and try and like get to the, the limit mm -hmm. and improve my skills also. And by the way, I'm actually planning to crochet a whole sweater that's on, Ooh. of course, like the teeniest crochet hook. Yeah, that sounds really cute. I am also pondering getting to that level of crochet with the threads and the I'm not there yet. I need to like still mentally prepare. <laughs> it's not that I want to be there. It's just that I really love this blouse and I want that yeah. blouse. Mm -hmm. 
that's exactly <laughs> a lot of my projects get picked that way I'm like I really want something like that so I should probably learn to make it <laughs> so and we pick the most difficult thing right? like, <laughs> why can't it ever be like an easy like bulky never something simple <laughs> big needle number 15 needle no <laughs> no size one needle so, <laughs> and so true yarn mm -hmm. yep so I got that one and then I put one on my dress form here because this is like one of my favorites that I've ever done. Um, this is from a 1930s pattern. And so it has kind of a, like a military inspired, like the World War I type uniforms with the high neck and stuff. A lot of those were still popular like in the 30s, that vibe. Um, so I knitted this one. It's another one with ginormous voluminous sleeves because that just seems to be something that I am drawn to. Um, but this one was a challenging project. I found a lot of the 1930s. This is part of a whole set. So there's also a skirt pattern. Um, but I found a lot of those patterns are a big mix of knit, crochet, and sewing. So you kind of like over the years have built enough skills where I can finally tackle these types of projects. So you knit all the pieces separately and then you sew them together um, as if it were like a sewing pattern. And then a lot of the finishing is crochet. So there's like little button loops and things like that mm. that get crocheted on. So um, I'm finally at the point in my skills where I've got enough of all three that I can make something like this all together. <laughs> now, when you're saying sewing, something different than mattress stitch? Um, like yes. the other vintage sweaters that you've made, they weren't in pieces that you had to put them together? Um, some of them were, yes. And some of them I was able to just, you know, pick up stitches like along the armhole um. or something like that. Um, but this one, like even this white band was knitted separately and sewn on. Mm -hmm. And so for some of this, I've used, um, regular thread as well, just so that it was hidden a little bit more. And like the bottom is closed with snaps. So there's a lot of like both mattress stitch and like thread and needle sewing. There's just a lot of things going on on this piece. Yeah. Did the instructions tell you specifically what to do or you just had to figure it out? No, the instructions, especially like from back then, they really assume that you know a lot, a lot of things. So it's just kind of like put the sweater together. Right. That's been my experience. <laughs> That's why I was asking you, like, yeah, did it say sew it with needle and thread? No, you just decided no. that that's what you wanted to do. Yeah, and oftentimes, because I'm learning through trial and error, I did try like with this button band, um, trying at first like with the yarn and just seeing which one looks better. And that's kind of how I do a lot of the projects, like which one just gets the look I'm going for and give that one a shot. Um, but yeah, this one was a lot of work and in, once again, losing the game of yarn chicken, I tried to guess on how much yarn I would need for the full suit and did not have enough for the skirt when I got done. So I was like, well, okay, it's just a sweater. <laughs> so. Because once again, those sleeves, they probably took up more enormous. yarn. Yeah. So you would totally, anticipate. Yeah, they're just huge down here. Um, so it took a lot more than I thought and it's pretty uh, small gauge knitting. But um, it was a really fun project and I overbought on the cream yarn. So I made the matching belt to go with it because I couldn't for the life of me find kind of an off-white colored thick belt like it called for um, to pair with it. And again, in the spirit of using extra remnants, I used more so I'm making uh, an accessory set right now so I have this little hat that's also from a 1930s pattern that I made with it and I'm also working on just like a little rectangular clutch purse so then I'll have like a full accessory set that I can use with this one or I can just take all the cream accessories and put it with another outfit 
a muff would be really cute. That would be really cute. So because it's sort of that feeling. It is. Like it's that Russian vibe. empire. Yes, exactly. So um, I've I'm just started doing myself. that. With I had two muffs that I inherited from my mother. And I thought, I'm never going to carry these. And I sold them on eBay. There was a mink Darn. one and a fox one. And I got rid of both of them. And I, as oh. soon as I sold the mink one, I had seller's remorse. Regrets. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I was like, oh, why did I do that? Like, even if I never carry it, it was such a cool thing. Now mm -hmm. that I'm like more into vintage, I yeah. probably would carry it. I live in a climate where winters are cold and yeah. There you sometimes go. I do dress vintage and it's hard for me to imagine in Fairbanks, Alaska, like going <laughs> out like in a 1930s outfit here in New York. There are people who are really weird, not like vintage, <laughs> not vintage weird, but like, you know, yes orange pants with like pink and orange checkered jacket mm -hmm. <laughs> and like a stovepipe hat in lime green these people are all over the place nobody even pays attention to them so it's no big deal here but in a place where it's maybe more conservative and less populated you don't see as many freaks <laughs> like we have. <laughs> yeah, it's very utilitarian dressing here, but it gets down to like negative 60. So I mean, like, those are just crazy temperatures, but I just look at pictures of what did people that were living here, what did they wear in the 30s and 40s? Like, they had the same weather we do. So what were they wearing? <laughs> um, and that's where I get a lot of inspiration because it clearly worked and they didn't have all the modern conveniences that we have like central heating or things like that even. So I look at a lot of old pictures. There's a lot of Alaska digital archives online, like for the museums and the state archives. And so I look and see what they were wearing. And that's kind of my fashion inspiration. <laughs> well, it's so it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I mean, I think that whole 49ers thing and the people who were going up into Alaska to dig for gold and or pan for gold. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them made it. <laughs> some of them yes. survived some of them and, did not. <laughs> and brought back the goods. Yeah, it's, it's yes. fascinating. I researched mm -hmm. somebody, I've done some genealogy and I researched somebody who was a friend of people in my family. There were a lot of people in my family who did not arrive in the United States through Ellis Island, but they were coming from Asia. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, a lot of my grandfather's cousins were born in India and mm -hmm. China and Japan, mm -hmm. Shanghai and Nagasaki. So when their descendants came to America, they came to the West Coast. Oh, yeah. Um, Southern California, San Francisco area also. But there was a friend of theirs who I have photographs of, and I tracked this guy, and I found him in the census, I don't remember what year it was, where he was up in Alaska on one of these, um, like a territory where they were strictly like looking for gold it yeah. wasn't like a regular house with an address it was like a, mm -hmm. I forget the nomenclature but it was like a special place a special area district or something yeah for the gold miners hmm. that's interesting yes yeah, very interesting over 100 years ago Everything now is like a hundred years ago. It's <laughs> like it's, it just rolls off our tongues so easily. I never thought I would be saying those words, but mm -hmm. yeah, they came here more than a hundred years ago. A lot of these people. Yep. So I also wanted to mention to you, I have been to Egypt as a oh, tourist. Cool. I never lived there mm -hmm. um, in 1980. I spent oh, 11 wow. days and 
I loved it. Of all the places that I have been, and I've been in about 40 or 41 countries of all of the places I've been, except for Paris. You know, Paris is a <laughs> special category. But of every place else, <laughs> Egypt is actually my favorite place. Yeah, I really loved living there. Very Where cool. in Egypt did you live? Um, I lived in Cairo. And then when I was in college, my parents lived at the other end of the country in Aswan. So, mm -hmm. so yes, we made the whole adventure from Alexandria all the way down to Aswan. So I, you know, I've done that. Circuit That's such a great, up great the tour. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I've, I think I've told this before on this podcast that when I was a child, and I'm so much older than you, you probably didn't have weekly readers, but there was like a little newspaper that you would pay, mm -hmm. I think, two cents a week. And you would, each child would get their own little newspaper. And it was only like maybe four or six pages, something like that. But I remember seeing a picture of that temple. building the S1 dam. So yeah. that was sometime, I guess, around 1960-ish. Mm -hmm. I, I was young, maybe early 60s. I don't remember exactly. Yeah. But they showed how they were taking it apart in pieces and numbering everything so that they could move it up the hill and reassemble yeah. it because it was being flooded out mm -hmm. when they built the dam. So I was very excited to be able to see that. But that was in 1980 that I went to mm -hmm. Egypt. So for me now, it's a distant memory. But <laughs> Luxor and Karnak, anybody so watching, if you ever have a chance to go to these places, go. don't miss it. If you're in Cairo, make the trip, get there, mm -hmm. because it is unbelievable. I mean, I've seen other ruins. Like I've been in... Mexico, and I've seen the pyramids mm -hmm. there, and of course the pyramids at Giza, but Luxor, yes, it's like beyond beyond. It's like a whole city of mm -hmm. like yeah. I didn't realize there was so much stuff. Like before I lived in Egypt, I thought it was more rare. <laughs> it keeps <laughs> but going, it's everywhere. And going, it's and going, awesome. like this whole city. Mm -hmm. We went, of course, in the daytime, but then we went at night. And they mm. do a sound and light show. You can't really see walking through it, the scope of it. But at the sound and light show, we were sitting high up and looking down on this whole city of unbelievably gorgeous structures that are thousands of years old. And I can't say they're in mint condition, but they're There's still a lot standing. Here. Mm -hmm. And they're just so unusual, so different from any other ruins. You know, I've seen the Roman form, the Colosseum, and mm -hmm. my, my husband and I honeymooned in Turkey. We were in Ephesus where there are ruins. I've seen lots of ruins, but Egypt is like unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And if you have a good Egyptologist who can explain what the mm -hmm. hieroglyphics mean. Yes, makes it way cooler. It's it's amazing. It's really, mm -hmm. really amazing. Mm -hmm. So lucky you. What <laughs> did you bring back from there? What are some of your treasures that you covet? Um, let's see. <sighs> trying to think. I, I just have little things. I'm like even looking around. This is my sewing room. I just have some things that we picked up like while we were living around there. Um, this is not from Egypt. This one is like from Yemen, but my mother makes jewelry with a lot of the beads, like the old silver work um, that's very popular there. Like the jewelry in the Middle East tends to be a more is more vibe. And I love that. So <laughs> I have a lot of um, just large jewelry pieces and things like that. I wasn't into like wearing vintage or uh, things when I was living there. Um, but since then, I've kind of, again, researched 
like things from the 20s, 30s, 40s that were in Egypt um, to kind of bring that into my style. I mentioned being a third culture kid and using fashion as a way to kind of express that uh, complex identity inside um, because when I was coming back to college, I knew that people would look at me and I look like a white Midwestern kid, um, but I didn't necessarily feel that inside because of how much I had experienced overseas and um, it had changed my worldview a lot. And so being able to integrate these little pieces of, you know, like Middle Eastern antique jewelry or, um, I have some scarves that have like Arabic printed on them that I'll throw on top of my vintage outfits or things like that. It just kind of like brings those little pieces that kind of, it just reminds me of my experiences and kind of makes it feel a little more me. So a lot of what I brought back is like clothing. <laughs> Egypt is famous for its cotton. I brought back a cotton mm -hmm. galabia. Yeah. I should pull it out and show it. Maybe I'll put a picture here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just definitely recommend that you can use all these skills to express yourself and find a unique style that, you know, you don't need to wear like straight 1930s. It doesn't even need to be historically accurate. You know, you can take pieces of different decades. You can take pieces of different experiences in your life and make something that feels you. Um, and I've also just really enjoyed uh, learning about other cultures as I've lived in different places or like being here in Alaska, learning about native Alaskan cultures and learning how to um, appreciate and embrace the different aesthetics of different cultures um, while at the same time embracing the people from those cultures. So not just saying like, oh, you have, you know, this cool thing that I like and taking it, but being like, let me have a relationship with you, understand the context that this design comes from. You know, let me buy it from somebody that's from that country, that kind of thing. And helping to um, incorporate and make vintage. I have like intercultural vintage as a tagline on my blog. Um, so making it that way um, so that you're incorporating not just the looks of different places, but also the actual people that are in those cultures um, and learning about them. That's been really enriching for me, not just the historical aspect, but learning from people that are different than me within a vintage context has been really fun. Such a beautiful sentiment. And thank you for sharing that <laughs> with us. I did think of one more little question. <laughs> okay. Your favorite time period of fashion. <sighs> That's difficult. Um, I think I would have to say thirties. I like the 1930s. Um, I like its kind of weirdness. <laughs> it has lots of like quirky silhouettes and details that were kind of strange, but it's it's still a modern type of sewing and a modern type of making clothing that you're not quite having to learn entirely new construction methods to add it to your wardrobe. Right, like, like the 40s, going, it's like the gigantic yeah. shoulders and the, all the padding. Yeah, and I love the 40s for that too. Um, it's just a little more utilitarian mm -hmm. for obvious reasons because it's during war. Um, so I love the make do and mend, but I like the make do and mend of the 30s too, where everybody was poor <laughs> and they're all trying to make fabulous clothing, you know, during the depression. There's just a lot of ingenuity and unique things to it that I really appreciate. So it's, it's probably my favorite. <laughs> well, you're certainly an inspiration to me. Keep on making those little short videos and Thank you. I hope my audience will come and look out for you. And um, thanks for sharing yeah. your sweaters and sharing your time with us. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been lovely. My pleasure. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>
I felt it was a very European style. It didn't strike me as American. <laughs> and maybe it's like your whole look. Um, not, no, you not, had not like a much. very unique look. The look, even with little or no makeup, is very like vintage, like Betty Davis kind of a look. Oh, thank you. So I thought, oh, she's probably European. And I really wasn't sure where you originated from. And then when I saw like your story that you've lived in Africa and the, well, now I know the Midwest, but I knew about Alaska. I was like, well, okay, uh, maybe that explains it. Because I don't see a lot of Americans jumping in and out of antique cars. And I mean, we have a thing here in New York on Governor's Island, there's a Jazz Age weekend. Mm, and yep. Governor's Island used to be a military base in New York Harbor, but I guess it's like decommissioned or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not used for that purpose anymore. But I guess it belongs to the federal government, this land, so mm -hmm. it can't be developed. I think at one time, Donald Trump was looking at making a casino complex there. I'm glad that that didn't happen. Um, they didn't mm -hmm. allow it to happen. Yeah. But they do special events over there. And you have to take a boat. You have to take a, a boat from Manhattan to get over there. So it's kind of fun. But they had a Jazz Age weekend where there are surprisingly a lot of vintage people. A lot of them are young. Like a lot of them are more your age than they are my age. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. there are people here who are into it, but I don't see them as much as yeah. I see people online. Like, yeah. yeah. But I think your videos are like second to none. I, oh, I think I can you. say that without offending anybody because I don't think anybody else is doing what you're doing. Really sweet. Yeah, a lot of the, the car videos especially, I was very pleasantly surprised to find there's a museum called the Fountainhead Auto Museum in Fairbanks. And they have an enormous collection of like rare and an unique antique cars. So like everything is 1940s and earlier, but they have this huge collection. And so the husband does the cars and then his wife does fashion. And so it's this combination of cars and fashion together. And so a lot of times they'll match, you know, the couture gown to the year of the car next to it. Or um, she just has an incredible collection of like house of worth and, beautiful designer garments, you know, 1920s evening gowns. And it's like in the middle of interior Alaska. It's this amazing treasure <laughs> that another internet vintage friend told me about. And so that's where a couple of my videos were filmed. I was able to work with them uh, to do those and was very privileged to be able to wear some of the clothing that they had in their collection, um, kind of like in their back room. Oh, so, so those weren't your clothes. No, a lot of those were from the museum's collection. Oh. So that was, yeah, it was just such a privilege and an honor. I was like, wow. I like, oh, no know, wonder I, I was so impressed. Wow. Yes. Still, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah. So that was so fun. So you never know, like vintage people are just all over the world. You never know who you're going to find. <laughs> so Great. fun.